Hi, good evening, everybody. This is Dr. Zhang. I'm live with you guys today. And uh, we are lucky to have Meredith and Matt with us today as well on the panel. This is the second week of our SBI breast imaging summer series. Today, we're going to talk about the high risk lesions. So, first, I want to have Meredith introduce herself. Hi guys, I'm Meredith Byers. I'm a breast imager in St. Louis, Missouri. I work for Washington University on the community side, managing the breast imaging centers at two of our hospitals. I'm so happy to have you here. We're gonna talk about a lot of stuff. We would love you to share questions. We'll answer them as best we can. And we just really appreciate your time. Great, thank you so much, Meredith. We are very lucky to have you here today with us online. And then I also have Matt online. Matt, could you please introduce yourself as well? Hey guys, it's me again. Thought you'd get rid of me last week, but um, I, uh, I'm back. Um, I'm happy to be here, excited to be here. I'm excited to uh, get into some details about these high-risk lesions. And um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, if you don't remember, I'm, I'm a breast imaging radiologist in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania at Allegheny Health Network. Great. And uh, we are very happy to have Matt with us again because he had such great input from last week. And uh, just the last but not least, a little bit about myself. So I'm graduating from residency. I'm currently a radiologist and I'm going to join University of Pennsylvania for breast imaging fellowship. So very lucky to have this opportunity to share some experience with you all today about high risk region. First, we are gonna talk about management because we know the management of high-risk region has always been evolving. And we also gonna talk about some temporary changes uh, different institution has implemented during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so first, just to get everyone on the same page, I want Meredith to tell us a little bit about how you guys manage the high-risk regions in your institution. Well, so I think that's a great question and a great place to start. And I'll actually, I'll talk a little bit, but then I want to segue to Matt because he's got some insights that's really going to help with our discussion. Yeah. I was pointing out that I've been out of training for a while and management has changed since I finished training. And I bring that point out because as we are navigating through the breast imaging world and management changes, uh, maybe your preferences change and you're working with um, surgeons, other imagers who have come out at different times, it's important for everyone to be on the same page. And that page may change each year, but it's important for there to be consistency. So when you are talking about switching from taking something to surgery to now watching it, perhaps as a BIRADS 3, or with something you would have recommended to follow one path and then you wanna to switch to another, you need to make sure your team is all on the same page. I'm sure there's nothing more frustrating to a breast surgeon than somebody who says, my patient has PASH, I'm referring her for surgery, and the next radiologist says, no, actually, we're not referring that for surgery. We need to, we, we can um, stop following that. So when you have two very different answers, it's really frustrating for our, who I consider our clients, which is our patients and our surgeons. So yeah. um, we've definitely moved from what the way I learned, which was if in doubt or if high risk, go to surgery, to really putting pa patients back in at least a short interval follow-up, and sometimes recognizing that we don't have to follow them at all. Um, Matt's got some really good information talking about some specific diagnoses, so I'll tag it over to him. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. So um, I, uh, when I was in training, um, mostly in residency, and then as we got into fellowship, um, we started transitioning, um, but it was still kind of in its infancy. But mostly during during most of my training, it was like Meredith, where it was basically if you got diagnosed with any number of the high risk lesions that you know were taught, they you just reflex go to surgery yeah. and um as meredith said you know that's been evolving literature has shown that that you know that's not always necessary for for some of these lesions now there are some lesions where yes you know the the upstage rate is um high enough to where it it doesn't really matter if whatever you know if you get it on a pathology result you treat it like it needs to be excised um, such as atypical ductal hyperplasia, pleomorphic LCIS. Um, I personally, I send papillary lesions to surgeons because, um, you know, there are, you know, some instances, some cases for papillomas where they can be followed, but I still have the surgeon decide that, um, you know, because especially if, if they're palpable and it's a papillary lesion, 
that 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 should come out. Um, uh, fiber epithelial lesions, concern for phylloides, we still, we excise all of those. But then there are some that have some gray area, uh, atypical uh, lobular hyperplasia. If, uh, if they're associated with calcifications and we feel like we adequately, adequately sample these calcifications, then we observe them. Um, but if they're found uh, with no calcifications, if, if we find them with an asymmetry or whatnot, then studies have shown that that should come out. Uh, some lesions, like, like Meredith said, don't even need to be excised, like flat epithelial atypia. Previously, we took those to surgery. Now, literature has shown that these can be observed. Um, Mucosial-like lesions, PASH, if, 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 uh, if, if we see PASH incidentally and it comes back as PASH, you know, we can observe those. Now, PASH has the um, tendency to grow and, and be deforming if, if you know, we do follow-ups and say that's with an asymmetry and the asymmetry continues to grow, then that would be an indication for excision. But sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes PASH just stays stable and you know, that's not gonna cause any harm. And this was all based off of literature. These, these um, recommendations that I have is all based off of literature that actually a colleague of mine, Lisa Sumkin, she and I started at the same time at our, at our job. Um, she came to this uh, to this job and saw that there was some variability between radiologists and between surgeons, um, as there are at a lot of different institutions. And the, the best way to cure um, variability between clinicians uh, is to look at the literature and synthesize that all into a chart. So I have actually a chart that I was just kind of reading off to you guys that my colleague uh, created. And it has really you know, change the way at least I practiced as far as, as high risk lesions go. And it really makes it kind of easier because there's, there's, it takes the guessing game out of it. You know, we, we have these guidelines on this form that whenever we get a pathology result and it has one of these, you go to, you know, after a while now at this point, you know, I'm used to using this where I don't really have to refer to it anymore. But when it first came out, you know, I could, I could refer to this this chart, and sometimes I'll still refer to it just to, you know, reinforce it in my brain, make sure that I'm 100% doing the right thing. But um, I encourage other facilities, other other healthcare facilities to, to do what my colleague, Dr. Sumkin did and, you know, go through the literature and, you know, basically synthesize all the recommendations, all the different routes you can take for all these different high risk lesions, because it really is helpful to know that some of the lesions don't need to be surgically excised and can be and can be adequately watched. Yeah, I think these are such great points because breast imaging has always been evolving. It's so important for us to keep up with the literature and always do evidence-based medicine. On the other hand, as you all brought up, there is definitely a certain preference. Like if certain surgeons just have certain preference, they feel more comfortable. So we are definitely willing to compromise that. And I think that's probably lots of people's uh, personal experience as well. I know some institutions, they have their own institution guidelines just to make sure, uh, try to get everyone on the same page. Uh, but uh, yeah, and talking about high-risk lesion, another very important and also interesting points are the devices because we usually localize those lesions for the surgeon to do surgical excision. And those devices has always also been evolving. Uh, especially recently, people start to use C's more often, so they don't have to do the same day surgery after you put the uh, C's in. Just want to see, you know, what's your experience using different devices and uh, how do you like that, you know, what's the pros and cons you feel about different devices? I just, I want to jump in real quick. Um, and um, before I get to the devices, I, I wanted to agree with you, Jill, and all of this, all of this organization or whatnot would be for naught if you don't have buy-in from your surgeon colleagues. So yeah. we need, we need to have any, as breast imagers, any decision that we make going forward, treating lesions and managing lesions, it has to be in concordance with what our surgical colleagues, what our pathology colleagues, what our oncology colleagues agree with. And so if we just, as radiologists, try to take what we think is right and just kind of do our own thing and it's at, at, you know, at odds with what the surgeons are doing or what, at odds with what the pathologists or oncologists are recommending, then there's still gonna be that disconnect. 
So yeah. I think it's really important when you do something like we did here at Allegheny Health Network and, and created, create kind of a, and that's, and that's really what, what happened in the fall was that, you know, Dr. Sumkin had not only buy-in from her radiology colleagues, but she went and talked to the surgeons and, and, you know, got the approval of the surgeons and, and all the other medical colleagues. And I think that's really important uh, to get buy-in from all of our other, you know, non-radiology colleagues. So um, as far as, uh, and, and I'm sorry, Mary, I don't mean to, to kind of you know, plow, plow through the, the discussion here, but since I'm talking, as far as, as, far as <laughs> things that we use to localize, um, the main two things that we use at my facility, at our facility, is uh, the radioactive seeds and wire localization. Now, there are, you know, pros and cons to both of those. I tend to prefer the radioactive seeds because it gives you flexibility with scheduling. I think it's actually easier to place. Um, and, you know, it's, it's better, in my opinion, for the patient. They don't have something sticking out of them. We stick a needle in and, uh, you know, to the patient's perspective, they're done. You know, they, they, have, that, they have that localizer inside of them. Um, there are some new cutting edge... Uh, um, materials. And I say cutting edge over the last couple of years, it's not really, you know, they're, they're the newer stuff, the RFID, which is a radio frequency pulse that we've been workshopping, workshopping here in Pittsburgh. Um, and I think, I think to, to great results, I, I really enjoy them. Um, I think they, they place, you know, similar to a seed, but uh, without the radioactivity, which is, which is a benefit. Um, and then there's the, the savvy scout, which uses uh, sonar or radar, um, and I, I don't have as much experience with that, but I do know that, that they're um, very, uh, very similar in, in their, from a radiology standpoint. I don't know, if, Meredith, do you want to? Sure. And so Matt, with the RFID, what do you think the future is with that? When are we going to see that as an opportunity of something to use? So we, we've been using it now. We've been, okay. um, we, we, it's not our primary thing. And again, with all of these localizing techniques, you have to have surgeon buy-in right exactly. and so yeah. there are some surgeons that haven't even converted to the seed because they like the wire and so if we know that you know dr x is the surgeon dr x likes the wire and so you know that creates a, a, a an issue not an issue but that just we know that that patient can't be scheduled for a seed they have to be scheduled same day for a wire um with the rfid right. um you know, we haven't got to the point to where it's ubiquitous throughout our system. We, mm -hmm. you know, in order to get it approved, we have to do 10, I, I think, I think radiology has to do 10 and, and, or I, I'm not sure the exact numbers, um, okay. but uh, we, we've, we're currently going through the process and then COVID hit, right? Right. <laughs> but uh, I, I placed, I placed four or five of them. Um, the, the big okay. difference between the RFID versus the seed is the needle is, is larger. Um, oh, okay, okay. And so that was, uh, that was a little bit of an adjustment. It's, it's almost like sticking someone with a McDonald's straw is what I was saying, but it's not- And is, that, not, is that harder on the patients? Well, it's, you know, the patient's numb. So the patient doesn't really notice it either way. It is, it is a bigger needle, it's a, it's a, okay. it's a thicker needle. Um, I didn't seem to have any issues with it. The patients that I did didn't seem to complain about it. It's Good. just, it's, you know, you just look at it and be like, wow, this is a bigger needle. Um, but uh, I, it, it worked well. The surgeons that, that, you know, used it after I localized seemed to like it. Um, so I, th I think that's a benefit if, if places can, and, and from what I've heard, the Savvy Scout is similar. Um, I, right. just haven't, I haven't had any experience. It's just the benefits of not going through all the radioactive stuff that you have to go through with, with placing the feed is, is very beneficial. It's a good point. And I think that, um, especially as we were talking to people who are coming out of their training um, recently, even for Jill to know that this is an evolving process and the product we use now may very well not be the product you're using five years from now. It's something that um, we use both the seed and the wire and it's something um, I have the benefit of um, rotating at our academic campus where I get to teach the residents and fellows and then being in our, in our suburban campuses, which is more of a private practice community feel. Uh, a couple of things are really important. Number one, like you said, your surgeon preference. And Jill, when you ask about um, the pros and cons, I'll tell you one of our surgeons really likes the seed mm -hmm. and wanted to have it and really made it happen for our hospital. 
another surgeon did not want to go through the training for it. So for her, that was uh, a non-option. So the pros and cons are your surgeon has to be on the same team that you are in terms of what they want to use. We then have surgeons who prefer different wires. And so the next people who have to be on your team are your technologists or the people doing the procedure with you because it's a, everybody needs to check themselves. Okay, we're doing sur surgery for Dr. X today. We need to make sure we have this equipment. We need to make sure we have it scheduled on the same day versus we need to schedule this patient ahead of time. And then you have to have your, if you have a nurse navigator or a nurse that works with you or somebody who's coordinating with the patient with their surgery time and their plan, who's connect, connecting all of that for the patient. So they have the same expectation. And I mean, it, and you know, it's, it's a lot. It's, a, it's very much a team approach. You, it comes down to your team. The one thing I would say, and, I, and I'm satisfied with both the, um, the seat and the wire, and I'm happy to try the, the RFID. Um, so it's just, I love get learning one more new thing to do, but even, even for both localizations and for your biopsy devices, because part of what we're discussing here, biopsy devices come in, and we all know there's a huge oh, yeah. variety of those out there, oh, and they're yeah. also evolving. The device we were using last year um, we were supposed to get change it in January, and then of course everything hit as of March, and so we just got it in earlier this week. So I think it's important for our residents and fellows and our, our our newly graduated trainees to get your hands on as many devices as possible. Don't be scared of them. Don't think, oh, I haven't used that before, so I can't use it. Connect with the product reps. Connect with your technologists. We get as much training because wherever you go, I promise they're going to use something different than what you're currently using. So the more you can, more uh, coals in your belt you can put with, yeah, I've, I've seen that one before. I've tried that, or I, I, you know, I prefer this one to that one, but I'm comfortable using both. Makes you a more attractive candidate, makes you a better radiologist and really makes it better for your patients. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's, those are all such great points because I think I also talked with some surgeons, uh, surgeon, uh, like a leadership, they sometimes like to use the seat because they feel like they save the OR time. Like for them, mm -hmm. if they have like empty OR for 30 minutes, it's a big deal. So they would rather, if patient insurance doesn't cover, they would rather share the cost with the radiology department to do the seat. And then, but then as, as you said, they do have to go through certain trainings and uh, certain surgeons are more comfortable with certain devices than the other. And we do have to work with them and see what's their preference, what's the best for the patients. So lots of different things to take into consideration. And uh, one of my surgeon friends was like, if it's a very experienced radiologist, when they talk to them for things, they are not sure. It feels like talking to another surgeon. So <laughs> I think that's a big compliment for us too. Absolutely. You know, this is so well, then tre they treat you as uh, their equals and uh, re they really like take your opinion into consideration. So I think that's really good for us uh, regarding job satisfactions. Um, also regarding those uh, devices, I, I think it's just like keep evolving and some of them are more expensive than the others. So cost oh, yeah. is also like a big thing as well. I, I, and uh, I think as you all said, especially some radioactive ones, some institution may have problems following the um, guidelines in case they lose a uh, seat or stuff. And then, then yeah, so, very, very interesting field, actually. I, I think in the next few years, we probably will see, as Mary just also said, we probably will see more devices. It's never going to be the one that you trend uh, that you're going to use. No, yeah, <laughs> it never will, will it? And I think, you know, that's probably to me one of the saddest parts of looking to the, towards the rest of this year is I really yeah. enjoyed RSNA for the, the chance to go get my hands on equipment, yeah. you know, to, to be able to sample everything that's out there. That's yep. obviously not happening this year, no. but um, that has for, for me been a real um, game changer in deciding what product we're going to try next. Mm -hmm. So yeah. let, let's hope we can get back to that because it's really important as a radiologist that you feel a comfort with our devices um, so, that, so that you and your patient and your surgeon are all being um, served well. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah. feel like RSA is such a platform for us to shop for new toys. And uh, so <laughs> this year, be virtual. We'll see. We'll see how, how that part uh, turns out. Uh, so regarding, you know, everything turns virtual. So how that has changed regarding your high risk lesion management with uh, this pandemic? I know certain places has been postponed some procedures. Just want to see what's your personal experience. Well, I'll go, go, I'll go first. Um, you know, it's been, um, it's sort of been a tale of two cities, right? 
when yeah. we went into when we went into shutdown, we continued to do diagnostics, procedures, and some surgeries. Not every surgery, um, and if we if it was safe to postpone them, then the surgeon and the patient chose to postpone it. Um, and so our 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 work day um, was really almost cut in half. Um, we weren't doing screenings. Mm-hmm. Now that we're back up and going, well, yeah. I mean, I feel like. Um, I feel like we're at the start of the Boston Marathon and they just started the race because it's like yeah. a trample to get there. And, yep. you know, a, a, a couple of things. Um, I think there's first, there's no one right answer. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you and your practice have to decide what's going to work for you. Um, I will tell you that I, that while I heard from various manufacturers that patients were um, scared to come back to the hospital, that's not been my experience. Patients mm-hmm. are ready and anxious and they want to come back and they're actually more anxious at the fact that we, they haven't seen us in the last three months and did that delay. And we'll talk about that at a future session, but did mm-hmm. that impact their lesion and um, their, their process? So we're trying to really almost like a boutique type practice, individually manage each patient. So it's yeah. not just about the lesion. It's about the lesion and the patient and her history and mm-hmm. her mindset. And yeah. so if one is, is still saying, I'm not sure, is it okay if I wait a couple more weeks to come in? Absolutely. But if the other is saying, you know, I, even though I know this lesion is this, you told me it was probably benign. I was supposed to come back in six months. It's really been stressing me out. Okay. Yeah. We can, we'll bring you back sooner. So um, it's really been for us a case by case decision. And what we did on Monday doesn't always match what we're doing on Friday because it's so, it's just such an evolution. Mm-hmm. I feel like we have a at least in our practice, we have kind of a, a game plan that we go in, we talk about on Monday morning and then on Friday evening, we vi- revisit and like what, what worked, what didn't. Okay, how can, we, how can we manage these patients more efficiently? How can we get them in so they can be seen sooner? What, who are we overlooking that we need to think about? So anyway, it's, it's, it's just been a very dynamic process for us. Absolutely, Meredith. I, you know, and that's, that's such, a, such a great point that you bring up with you're not, you're not only treating the lesion right now, you're treating the patient because not every patient is handling the situation the same as each other. Um, and I think that's important to not lose sight of that as you are going along and, you know, running a breast center and seeing, like, like you said, treating it like a boutique. I'm just kind of reiterating what you're saying because I agree with everything. I absolutely agree with everything. And, um, you know, we, when, when COVID first hit, we stopped all screening and we really, you know, stopped all high risk treatment. You know, the surgeons were only surgerizing cancer and up until the middle of May, it was like that. And so there was a backlog of high risk lesions, you know, that developed. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't astronomical, but it was enough to where, you know, there needed to be a catch up. And, um, you know, now, you know, we're back to, we can offer, you know, treatment or, or, or diagnostic stuff to anybody right now who wants it. But, you know, we have, I, I was, I, I was telling people last week that last week was my busiest week since, you know, the late November when people are trying to catch up for their insurances rolling over in December. Um, it was, it was a madhouse where I was at. And that's just, people are ready to come back. People are ready to come back and, and get their, what they know is the right healthcare um, for their breasts. And, you know, that, that, you know, we were talking last week, that doesn't just extend, that just, that doesn't just apply to breasts. I mean, people are ready to come back and get all their other healthcare maintenance stuff, colonoscopies, blood pressure checks, seeing their PCP. And, you know, um, I, I think I kind of got off tangent on, on what the original, what the original uh, question was, but you know, the, the long and the short of it is, is that there was a, a, a two, two, two-ish month delay there in the treatment of high-risk lesions, and now we're back treating them. And it's important for patients to know that, you know, if, if it was recommended that, you know, you should get this treated, that whenever you feel comfortable coming back to the hospital, that we're ready for you. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're ready for you. And we're actually over prepared. We've made our place the safest, safest it could be. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure you guys are in the same scenario that we are. We're actually doing more exams now with some with fewer staff because we've had some furloughs. 
Mm -hmm. And so we are really playing the catch-up game and we'll be there for a while. Mm -hmm. I think it's important if you have a way to review your patient population who missed their exam during this time, if you have any sort of filter or um, absolutely ability to look back and remember these are, you know, I think of these as our clients, these are our business. Mm -hmm. And it's the beauty of breast imaging is that it's both an art and a science. The mm -hmm. science is we need to get everybody back. The art of it is looking through your list and saying, hey, actually this one needs to get back sooner than that one may. And if you can partner with somebody in your practice who's able to um, connect with the patients, contact them, send a letter, whatever you can do. Um, we recognize that patients coming back don't know what the new COVID normal looks like in our breast center. So they are, they are anxious and itching for that connection for you to say, we're paying attention to you. We wanna see you back. We've done all these things and we think it's time for you to come back. They're, they're really ready for that. Yeah, I think those are really great points, uh, especially I, I will, actually my next question was about how do you prioritize those patients because there is a, such a backlog. And I think you guys bring up such a great point. It's not just the bring them back based on the lesions. It's also depends on like how the patient feel because we want to do patient centered care. If certain patients just feel like more uncomfortable and we do, you know, try to make the efforts to bring them back a little bit sooner. Uh, and also, you know, everyone has been like ready to try to get those patients in so we can, you know, make them feel more comfortable. But uh, just to, like uh, curious, what are the questions and the concerns? So patients usually ask you since they did have a delay. So what are those questions and concerns that they brought up when they come back? For, for me, I, you know, I haven't had much in the way of, of questions, concerns. People, mm -hmm. um, you know, I was, I was thinking about this actually the other day, like, you know, people that have come back that have had the delay, you know, that was originally you were recommending a six month follow up and now they're coming back in seven, eight months, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, when I go in and, and talk to these patients, they, you know, they understand that what happened was necessary, what happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the rare case, I think I've only had one or two instances to where, you know, the patient that have been, you know, that had a recommended follow-up and that now we're upgrading it to a biopsy. Yeah. They, they understand that it wasn't, it wasn't just, we weren't just telling them to delay just for the sake of delaying. We were doing that. I mean, it was a necessity. We had to flatten the curve, right? Mm -hmm, and, yeah. you know, that obviously there hasn't, we, we don't know if there was a, 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 a problem with the, the, the one to two month delay in, in diagnosis. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there hasn't really been time enough to study that right now. Mm -hmm. But I assume, you know, just from being a breast imager that, if there is an effect, it was it was a minimal effect on those few lesions that um, that happened to have a delay and you know a one to two month delay in diagnosis. Yeah, I can I completely agree with that. I will tell you a couple things. Um, I think we also have to recognize the mental anxiety that mm -hmm. COVID has imparted on everybody, patients, physicians, etc. So yeah. uh, most of my patients are not worried about the delay, but are happy to get back in. Mm -hmm. I have others who have been stressing about their BIRADS 3 lesion mm -hmm. and have said, okay, can I come in now? Because it's all I've been thinking about. Many of those are my patients who have a history of cancer, yeah. um, either recent or remote. And so this time at home in isolation has really ramped up anxieties. And so that's why, that's why I talk about the, um, the boutique practice of your BIRADS 3 might actually be, be more important than her BIRADS 3 so that you can both be seen in the right amount of time. So mm -hmm. we're trying to, to approach it from that. Um, and also, I think our journals for the next year are going to be talking about um, what this, um, you know, two month delay did to our um, patient population, to our numbers, to our stats. Yep. If you are, if you're watching this call and you're going to keep watching, um, that's one of the things I'm going to talk about when I do my talk in August is what did this do to equip? What did it do to our yearly inspections? How are we all navigating some of the, the details around it? But I think this is going to be a, a subject that um, we're talking about for a while. Future plug right there. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's not such great points. It's like very individual based, like how people handle this, because it's just uh, very stressful for us too during this pandemic. Uh, lots of people actually got uh, redeployed to different fields uh, just to fill the. Were the you gap. redeployed? Yeah. Uh, we are just about to, and then the curve started to like do that. Ah, oh, so you're right on the cusp, huh? <laughs> right on the cusp, yeah, yeah, right on the cusp. Yeah. Uh, 
so I think also just want to say, you know, sometimes we do have an upgrade of the lesion uh, after biopsy based on pathology. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you do anything different because there's a delay? Would you recommend some additional imaging, uh, you know, at this point with all those patients coming back? Um, I'll let Matt go first on that because I'm interested to see what he, hear what he says. No, I, I haven't had that yet, <laughs> to be honest with you. I I haven't. I mean, I was just thinking, you know, conceptually what I would do. If, yeah. You, know, if you have a if you have a high risk, say you have an ADH and and you know it, it was upstaged to DCIS. I you know assuming they didn't take wide local excisions and and they came to me and said you know what imaging I would get an MRI. I would have low threshold for getting an MRI. Yeah. Um, just to see if there's, there's surrounding enhancement, see if there's, you know, uh, other findings in the breast that are, mm -hmm. you know, concerning. Um, but I, I, I really haven't encountered that yet, but I definitely, you know, as, as a global comment, I would definitely have a low yield for, that would be the next step would be to get an MRI and see what it looks like. Yeah. I think that's so interesting. You say that because when we went into our shutdown, really yeah. breast MRI went off the table. We weren't mm -hmm. doing them. Um, the minute we um, opened back up, it was like um, a breast MRI party. <laughs> we're, we're doing them all day, every day. Yep. You get an yep. MRI, you get an MRI, yeah. you get an MRI. Yeah. Um, what's been interesting about it is I'm like you. I'm actually much more, I'm finding myself more liberal in recommending it sure. than I was going in. In part, it's a business strategy. It's yeah. an exam that um, I think is worth its weight in gold. Sure. So if a patient can get it, I want her to get it. Sure. Also, yeah. we've got we've got space on the magnet now that we maybe maybe didn't have six months ago, mm -hmm. and we may mm -hmm. not have three months from now. Mm -hmm. So yeah. trying to take advantage of just the timeliness of that. Um, but also, sense. I feel like um, patients, especially in my I, I would I, I would use it in my younger patients, the under fifty year olds, mm -hmm. they're really. Um, desirous of having one they 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 read about it they know about it they want to know if this is appropriate for them absolutely so we're trying to, yeah we're trying to accommodate as many of them as we can mm -hmm. so that's probably the one the one exam that i feel like i'm, I'm pushing a little bit so um yeah oh, absolutely. Up, I, don't, I don't think you're wrong in that in that standpoint i mean i i i wouldn't say that i'm pushing it as as you know more or less than i have in the past but i you know like I said, I, I would have a low threshold dealing with all this stuff. And yeah. if someone comes to me and, you know, it's, it's yeah. I might use it more for problem solving now than I would in the past. That's, that's exactly right. That's how I would phrase it. And I'll actually tell you when we got back to our, to our, you know, resumed normal schedule and that first breast MRI came across the list, I kind of did a whole happy dance. I was <laughs> yeah, so right, happy to see right. it. Like I definitely did that for a screener too. Like, I, I like, <laughs> as soon as I started seeing the screening list, start the pot. I'm like, holy crap, we got screeners again. This is awesome. <laughs> exactly. Like I, I, I had missed them. I didn't realize that I was so attached to them, but I, I missed some <laughs> of my friends. And, and, and now, now my, my friend exams are back. So yeah. anyway. Yeah. I think also that probably put patients at ease too, because with this delay, some patients may be more anxious, especially as you guys said, they had a breast cancer history or they have like strong family history. You know, with this delay, they may be more concerned about uh, the extent, you know, the extensive, whether the lesion become more extensive over time. Um, so, you know, it, it is actually a good point. We have great tools like breast MRI, so we can take a closer look in addition to the mammals and ultrasound that the patient may be getting. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's our, uh, we had a great discussion today. I feel like I learned so much from both of you. Just this want to say fantastic. any last few words you guys want to add before we end the session? I'm actually, yeah, I'm actually going to throw out a question for you two um, yeah. that I just want to hear your opinion on it. This is not about mm -hmm. a high risk lesion, but about benign lesions. Mm -hmm. I've been trained that apocrine metaplasia is a benign lesion. I am finding that I have more and more patients asking about it and what they need to do about it. So I'd love to hear how you guys approach it and if, if maybe you do something differently than I'm doing. Well, I can start. I, um, it depends on the concordance of the biopsy. Um, if it's concordant, if I feel like it's, it's able from metaplasia, I, it's benign to me. I, okay. there's no follow-up. So maybe. you're not putting them back in short interval follow-up after no, that? No, no. Okay. I mean, it's, it's a case by case basis. Um, yeah, I would I totally have to agree. see the, the image findings, but if I'm comfortable with that biopsy result, then I don't do anything else with them. Okay. I think yeah, it's, uh, um, no, go, go ahead. ahead. I no, think no, go ahead. Some, of my, some of my attendees follow up 
uh, like if you know, some of them follow up six months. Mm -hmm. I find we have, um, for us, one of our surgeons likes to follow that up. Oh, and no. again, I completely respect that. Um, but I always think, is there something I'm missing that maybe there's a reason to do it and I'm, it's not on my radar? So you guys seem like great people to ask. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, that was how I was taught. And, um, you know, I, like I said, you know, occasionally I'll think, ah, you know, I don't like, I don't like how that looks and, you know, that. Yeah. I, I might follow it up that way, but if I'm just, if, if it was an iffy lesion to begin with and it came back apocrine metaplasia, then I'm just like, you know what, that's, that's benign. I, I agree with that. It was an iffy lesion to begin with. I'm, I'm good with it. Yeah. You really have to know what your, where you, what your comfort level was with it going in. Yep. Yep. So I, yeah, I completely agree. <laughs> yeah. So Matt, any questions or any last few words you want to do? No, this is great. You uh, hit it out of the park today, Jill. You were a much better host than that uh, that buffoon last week. <laughs> no, uh, I learned from you. I learned from the best. That's why. No, it, it was a pleasure speaking with both of you. This is a blast doing this. I hope everybody watching had fun. I, I'm thoroughly enjoying this. Um, yeah, I, I can't thank you both enough for, for coming today and, and uh and discussing breast imaging, breast health with me. This is fun. Yeah, thank you for organizing this. If it wasn't you taking the initiative, we wouldn't have this opportunity to learn from each other. I feel like it's just so great to be able to learn from both of you today. And I definitely look forward for future sessions. Absolutely. Well, thanks, okay. Jill. You're an amazing host. Congrats on your move. Good luck with um, the next stage. We're all rooting for you. Yeah, oh, thank you so much. newly minted breast fellow there, Jill. That's right. Um, thank you. Just, just a programming note, we do have another one scheduled next week. Dr. Malik uh, will be our, our host. Um, and uh, I will not be on it, so you won't see me uh, next week. So that'd be good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I will be watching thoroughly, and I'll be promoting it. So to everybody watching, we really appreciate it. Yeah, thank yeah. you all so much. I really appreciate yep. you guys joining. And also without your support, it wouldn't be such a fun session. So uh, we, I have so much to learn from all of you and I definitely look forward to watch thoroughly of the future sessions and also participating as well. Thank you, it was awesome. All righty, all right. We'll see you guys in future then. Bye-bye. Hey, bye. Have a good week, everybody. Yeah, bye. <laughs>